Hello, everyone. Today I will be reading chapter two of Don't Tell the Nazis. First off, I want to say thank you all my subscribers for subscribing and liking this video. Um, please subscribe if you haven't already and smash that like button. <clears throat> so, at the end of a book, I will be doing about two videos of something else i don't know what yet but something else but most most likely like i don't know i'll figure out hopefully my next video tomorrow <clears throat> and i'll also be doing this every single day so second chapter of don't tell the nazis and also make sure to comment what book you want me to read next and any tips you have for me and i will be getting a microphone tomorrow um for my friend at school so here we go chapter two is in the loft it was almost too quiet across the road the seagulls house was dark beside it saint mary's ukrainian catholic church stood boarded up and silent but there was a flicker of a curtain from the window of father andrew's house just beside it was his wife checking to see if it was safe to go out yet i stepped onto the shed and put the paint the pail down and held the pistol with both hands and rolled around. No one was there except for Krasa, and she was looking spooked. She stomped and she stomped one hoof, as if she was agitated from last night's explosions and gunfire. Any intruder would have made it that much worse. I held the gun behind my back and put up my face to hers. Shh! I I whispered, rubbing the bridge of her nose. I climbed the wooden rugs to the loft holding the gun in one hand. When my head was just below the hole in the floor, I counted to three and burst up, trying to steal, steady the pistol with one hand. Don't move! A scrabbling noise in the far corner. I pointed the pistol. Christia, put the gun down. It's me. Joseph? I climbed up the rest of the way. My cousin sat long. My cousin sat cross-legged in a nest of shop beside our stash of goods from Auntie Stefa in Toronto. Joseph looked exhausted. The Soviet secret police nearly caught me last night. Why would they be after you? I asked. The NKVD are always after someone. Right now, they seem to be rounding up educated Ukrainians. Where's Boris? I asked. My cousins were usually inseparable. Not there's a good place in the forest. A lot of us have taken refuge there. I'm hoping Boris found it. Found it. Is that where you, you will hide to? He shook his head. The NKVD could follow me there. You can stay here. That would put you in danger. But where will you go? He shrugged. I will have to see. I crawled over to where Joseph sat and rested my head on his shoulder. I've really missed you since you've been off to the university. I miss you and Maria too, she sa he said. Can I visit you and live after the Soviets leave? I I like that, he said, and I'm hoping that you can attend university yourself one day. Maria too? Of course. He rested his hands on top of mine and noticed his familiar crooked baby finger. Once, when he had been playing hide and seek, he got his finger caught in a door. It wasn't my fault. I ended up healing with a permanent belt. Bend. Why don't you slip into the house by the bedroom window and Mama will make you breakfast? That's too dangerous, Garcia, for you and for me, said Joseph, and I need you to be on my way. What about some milk from Crossa then? I asked. That sounds good, says, said Joseph, and it will be quick. He followed me down the ladder and stood in the corner as we milk Crossa. When I was finished, he held the heavy pail to his lips and swallowed a few gulps. Go about your business if I'm not here, he told me, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. I leaned into him and, and to him and rested my head on his shoulder. Stay safe, cousin. You and Boris both. He kissed the top of my head. You too, cousin. We stood like that for a full minute before he stepped away. Get going, Christia. I slid the pistol into my pocket and blew Joseph one last kiss. Then he hefted to the bucket and walked back to the house. Mama was wiping down the wooden stove with a soapy rag. She paused mid-swipe as I set the bucket on the table. Why did you do the milking in your nightgown, she asked me, and why did you take, did you take my pistol? 
I gave Mama back the gun and told her about Joseph. She inhaled sharply. The bedroom door creaked open and Maria walked out, wearing the shabbier of our shared outfits. I almost wore the good clothing, seeing as it was lying there, tempting me. But I decided that we too, that it wouldn't be fair. She said, to save arguments, the two of us had long ago agreed that the first one to rise got to wear the best skirt and blouse. Now what's this about Joseph? N.K.V.D., said Mama. He's in our shed. Maria's face paled. Doesn't he know he's putting us in danger? I kept my mouth shut, but I could feel the anger boiling, boiling inside. Why did Ma Maria think only of our safety? Do you even care about Joseph, I asked? So much for keeping my mouth shut. Mama looked from me to Maria. Enough, she said. Christia, go get dressed. But go. I felt like stopping to the bedroom, but I knew Mama wouldn't put up for that either. So with all the dignity I could muster, I walked to the bedroom to change. As soon as I was there, my anger lightened. How could I be angry with my little sister when she had left me the best skirt and blouse? Yes, we had a deal, but Maria could argue that I forfeited the good clothes by not getting dressed when I got up. It was sweet that she hadn't done that. And I didn't mind that Maria wore the shoes because they pinched my heels. By the time I stepped back into the main room, Maria had fed our two chickens and had already left to get, to get water. There were chores to do, whether there were still NKVD about or not. I went back to the shed, hoping Joseph was still there, but he had left. Joseph, dear Joseph, I whispered under my breath, be safe, be brave. I looped a rope around Cross's neck and led her outside. Taking her to pasture, pasture should have been a job shared by Maria and me, but Maria was terrified to take the long walk on her own. Normally, I didn't mind, as it was pleasant to spend time with Krasa, and it was certainly easier than lugging endless buckets of water. But if there was still an NKVD around about, I was sure to run into them. There was no way out of this storm, though, because if I didn't take Krasa to pasture, her mouth would dry up, and then where would we be? When I looked toward town, all I saw was Maria waiting in line at the pump chatting with Nathan Siegel. He was 11, but he had been sweet on my sister for as long as I could remember. The Zooks next door still had their house closed up tight. Mr. Zook, a bookkeeper, had been deported to a Siberian slave camp more than a year ago. So it was only his wife, Valentina, and her son, Petro, living there now. I turned and stood on tiptoe to look, to look toward the outskirts of town, and again, no people were out except for me, Maria and Nathan. Low in the sky, a German airplane, distinctive with its cross and, swat and swastika, growled above us, making cross a treble. I had seen dozens of, of these in the last two days, all heading toward Lviv. I hoped the Germans would banish the Soviets once and for all. We started on our two-kilometer walk to the pasture, and I kept my eyes to the ground and my ears turned for unusual sounds. We passed the Gitaz house beside ours. But it was also dark and silent. Mr. Kata ran a school supply store and Minnie Kata was a doctor. Everyone called her Dr. Minnie. I imagined my classmate Dolik still sound asleep in his soft warm bed. His little brother Leon too. Mama cleaned for Dr. Mina. The Katas were well to do enough that they could have been deported to Siberia as Borgios. But Dr. Mina took on some of the Soviet officers as her patients. Mama just had to be careful to avoid them when she went in to clean. Though, because if the Soviets thought Dr. Mina had a servant, that could still get her deported. I could feel my face getting hot at the thought of my mother working as a servant to my classmate. But Dr. Mina was so kind, just like her husband. More than once, he had given us pencils and paper for school at no charge. And Dr. Mina had looked after Tato when he was dying of lung cancer. She had been in our house nearly every day during that awful time. I continued down the road, passing many empty houses, thinking of all the changes in the two years of Soviet current occupation of the 4,000 or so people who had lived in Vrets, before the war, only 800 were Ukrainians, with about 1,600 Poles and the same number of Jews. When the Polish government had held power, they put a quota 
on Ukrainians in professions and trades, so most couldn't afford to live in town. They could only be farmers. On our entire long street of St. Ola, Karl Marx Street now, according to the Soviets. We are just four Ukrainian families, us, Uncle Roman, and Auntie Irina. Because of our blacksmith shop, the Zuk family and father, Andrei, and his wife, Anya. The surrounding farmlands were the opposite, mostly poor Ukrainian families, which just a few Polish and Jews family mixed in. At the beginning of the occupation, the Soviets were kind to the poor. At the beginning of the occupation, the Soviets were kind to the poor, but they terrorized the wealthy, meaning most, mostly Poles. Many were killed or, de or deported to slave camps in Siberia. Now it seemed they were turning on the Ukrainians. All at once, I heard footsteps behind me. My heart raced, but it was just Uncle Roman, my father's brother. He stepped in beside me, mopping his brow with his yellow handkerchief. Christia, my slow niece, he said. It looks like we're both late this morning. It took a long time to get Lysia out of her stall. I reached over and patted her nose and lowered my voice. Joseph was hiding in our shed this morning, but now he's gone. Ah, uh, Uncle Roman said, thank the Virgin Mary that my son is safe. Did he have any news? It was hiding in the front from the Soviet, Joseph thinks. Uncle Roman's shoulders relaxed. When Boris and Joseph had lived at home, they would alternate taking Lisa to their pasture, and we often walked together. Since they'd gone to university, it had fallen to Uncle Roman to walk the cow himself. He didn't seem to mind, though. It, had, it gave him a break from the blacksmith shop, and he'd often met his friends, and they'd chat as their cows munched the grass. Uncle Roman's pasture was just beyond mine. Before we took Lisa there, he gave me a stern look. Wait for me when Krasov is finished grazing so we can walk back to town together. It's not safe with the shoulders about. Thanks, Uncle, I said, standing on my toes and kissing him on his cheek. I guided Krasa toward the I guided Krasa through the bushes and undid her rope so she could graze while I picked raspberries. I should have brought a pail, but between Joseph and all the shooting last night I had forgotten. At least my apron had deep pockets. I reached through with the thorny bushes to get to the ripest berries. Just then I heard low grinding screeches coming from the road. A term brusque was guiding a slope back towards us as it put a cart filled with a variety of goods that looked like they'd been stolen from different houses and stores. His wife, Oja, sat on the bench beside him, and their daughter, Sonia, sat perched on a carved box as she studied a painting of a long-dead princess on her knee. I knew exactly where the paint painting had been sold from, the Tarnowski house in our town square. Mama used to clean that house, too, before the war. Next, two Soviet trucks from past, one was piled with high stolen goods, the other carried half a dozen soldiers clutching rifles. I thought the branches close and kept still, counting the long seconds it took for the trucks to pass. A minute later, three loud gunshots erupted in rapid succession, even as they fled, the Soviets wanted to scare us. Chapter three is called Blood and Raspberries. Thank you for watching. Hope you like, hope you enjoyed this video. And I want to give a shout out to my editors, um, Davis Everett and Will Bergman. They are from my school and they are amazing. They edit my videos. Well, they just started this one. But yeah, and please subscribe, smash the like button, and hope to see you tomorrow when I read the next chapter of Don't Tell the Nazis. Thank you very much for watching.